All right, let's see who's coming in here. Eight ways to reinvent yourself. Right now, Jamie, how you doing? Hey, Denise, doing there you go. Sheila, doing welcome. Great. Hey, Desiree, it's good to see you back. Our friend in Dallas. All right. Yeah, we open the doors, people coming in. You know, the great thing is about a webinar is everyone's got a front row seat. That's true. Yeah. Very true. And, it, and this is a good one for people who join us. You're gonna you're gonna get the takeaway. We're gonna send you a link to download the ebook, Eight Ways to Reinvent Yourself. And if you're joining, let us know in the chat box in the comments where you're coming from. I'd love to know where you are spaced out across the country, the globe. So drop us a message and let us know where you're coming from. Yeah, I'm okay. coming from colorful Colorado right now. Chicago. All right. Washington, DC. Sheila, there we go. Nice. Hot Dallas, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Already, it's already hot. I grew up in Houston, so I can't believe I used to work outside when I was in high school. So I wouldn't probably wouldn't last very long now. <laughs> Pittsburgh, PA, Dan right. out there. All right. We're covering it. We have anybody out west? Yeah. Hear me. Okay, more from Washington, D.C. Yep, as you could. Hey, hey, Hap, if you could, uh, if you've got a question, everyone here can use the chat box, so a little bit more interactive, some, some Q&A for folks. Palm Beach Garden, Florida. Welcome, Brett. Palm Beach. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I want to go to Palm Beach right now. <laughs> okay, we're going to give it one more minute to get, the, get people in their seats. Yeah, and if you're just joining us, oh, crazy Los Angeles. There you go. Nice. Drop That's us a comment. Let us know where you're coming from. Coast to coast so we've got a west. <laughs> we've got a West Coaster. Yeah. That's good. So we are covering Michigan. Ah, awesome. And Mike then, from Michigan. We, we literally have eight good case studies for you all. It's going to be, it's really, even when we were preparing for this, you know, the second, third time through, it was making us think about our business. So this, um, this is promising to be enlightening for folks. Yeah, I'm excited. Okay, Albuquerque. Hey, you're near me. I'm from colorful Colorado, Clearwater, Florida. All yeah. right. There you go. Okay, so we're at, we're at 12.02. I said, I said we, we jump in, Jamie. You want, you want to take the lead here? Sure. Well, I want to welcome everybody. <laughs> so excited to see you on this great Wednesday. We're here to talk about eight ways to reinvent yourself in a crisis. And this is a great um, mastermind presentation here, a, a webinar to cover real stories of business owners who have invested in change to emerge from a crisis with a better, more durable, and more valuable company. And so just to give you a little bit of my background before we get things kicked off here, and then I'll introduce Kirk. Um, my name is Jamie Zalman. I am originally a born and bred Baltimore, Maryland native. I uh, have had quite a lot of experience in telling the stories of CEOs. I used to run a magazine publishing company back on the East Coast that was in seven cities up and down the East Coast. And we featured some of the most uh, enterprising CEOs on the covers of the magazine. I ran that organization for 13 and a half years. I met my husband out here in Colorado uh, and moved out here about three years ago. So I have had the privilege of working with the 2% CEO Mastermind and Foresight CFO. I now currently coach CEOs uh, and form CEO Masterminds. So I have several groups that I operate and run. Um, given my former experience in publishing and running a magazine company, I also founded another business um, in the fitness and health industry, sold that business before I moved out here to Colorado. And uh, I have always surrounded myself with incredible entrepreneurs and CEOs. It's what I love. So now I am having the privilege of being able to bring CEOs together in group settings and let them learn from each other. And so I have uh, several virtual masterminds and in-person masterminds, and that's what I do. 
Kirk, do you want to introduce yourself? I do. Jamie, you've been busy. I'm surprised you have time to do a webinar here. So that's, <laughs> you know, thank you for jumping in and you know, get, getting the word out a bit. So, so my, my name is Kirk. I'm the CEO of Foresight CFO. So it's all about visibility with, with the numbers, financial management. And I, I teach the same to um, Georgetown students, graduate students at Georgetown uh, as another way of, you know, kind of accomplishing the mission and, you know, helping more people do better. Um, you know, I'm, the, I'm married to one and the father of two. And, uh, you know, before getting back to building businesses, I was, I was go army for a number of years. And, um, I'm proud to say that both my sons are continuing that tradition where both one just graduated from West Point. So he's off to shoot cannons at Fort Sill and then he'll be at Fort Drum with the 10th Mountain Division. And my, my youngest just completed his freshman year at West Point. So I'm really, I'm really proud that in, in this day and age, they're, they're stepping up to serving to, you know, another way of impacting all of us. So, um, so they, thank you, Jamie. Awesome. Well, we're so glad that you all joined us. And um, as we go through this presentation, this webinar, uh, we are going to, at the end, provide you with a free copy of this downloadable Eight Ways to Reinvent Yourself in a Crisis ebook. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but before we get started with things, um, shouldn't we take a poll to find out who's in the room? Let's do that. Great. Well, I love this quote. Um, and then we'll get to the poll. No mind is complete by itself. It needs contact and association with other minds to grow and expand. And that was Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich from 1937. Mm. And that's a great quote um, because you're right. We all do need association to connect and grow. And by being here on this webinar, you're connecting with others. Um, and so I think it resonates. Yeah, but time tested. It still, still holds true to, to this day. So let, let's do the poll here. I'm going to launch the poll. And this, this your responses are completely anonymous. We, we will share the responses as a, you know, as kind of a percentages in a room. And, and this will help, you know, all of you plus us know who's here and what we can guide the conversation to be, you know, even more relevant to, to you. So it'd be great. There, there's 25 of us in the room here. If we can get to 75%, that'd be amazing. So just take a second. We're looking for your top line revenue in the prior year. And are you the CEO, president, or owner? Take a second to. Yeah, we got 72% respond. And we're almost, yeah, we're almost there at 19 out of 25. Fantastic. This is great. This is, yep. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the results here so that you can see again it's anonymous, but you'll see from a percentage standpoint who's in the room. So right, right, you can see the spectrum. I mean, 90% of us are CEOs, and then uh, there's you know 71 percent are, are doing business between zero to five million, and the rest are you know that roughly 29%. I can still do math in my head. It's you know, as I as I age, it gets more difficult. But I can still do it. 30% uh, are doing you know, 5 million plus. So fantastic. Great. Oops. There you go. There we go. Now we can see the results. Now you can see. <laughs> well, so, thank you guys for sharing and thank you guys for taking and participating in our poll. This helps us in terms of understanding who's in the room. Great. There you go. Thank you. Awesome. So are we ready to jump in? We're ready. Born ready. Born ready. Great. So as we go through this, we have eight specific case studies that we're going to be sort of diving into and sort of explaining their stories. And Kirk and I are going to go back and forth and we're going to alternate here so you can hear different tones and perspectives. Um, but these eight uh, examples are really, really important. Um, as you look at them and you hear their stories, it's going to make you think differently about your business. I know it made me think. So let's start first here with Stephanie Breedlove, the founder of Breedlove and Associates. Associates. This starts uh, back in 1992 during record deficits and increased poverty. So in 1992, there were 10 million Americans out of work. The country faced record deficits and poverty where welfare roles were growing. Family incomes were losing ground to inflation and jobs were being created at the slowest rate 
since the Great Depression. That's when Stephanie Breedlove started a payroll company. And rather than compete with the big providers, she decided to focus on providing payroll for parents who had a nanny. And it was this tiny slice of the payroll market. But yet 20 years later, she sold Breedlove and Associates for $54 million. Mm. So there's something to learn here. You know, to grow, she had the choice. She could either sell more to her existing customers, i.e. busy couples that often need lawn care or house cleaning or grocery delivery services, or she could stick to her niche of paying nannies. Most consultants and experts would say it's easier to sell more to existing customers and they're right, but it doesn't make your business more valuable. Breed love decided to stick to her niche and find out that there were, and she found that there were more parents who needed to pay their nannies. And that decision is what laid the foundation for a more valuable business. So investors like Warren Buffett look for companies with a deep and wide competitive moat. That gives the owner pricing authority. And when you have a differentiated product or service, we call it having the monopoly control. And companies with monopoly get significantly higher acquisition offers. So rather than selling existing customers generic services in commoditized markets, Breedlove focused on selling one thing to as many customers as she could. So the takeaways here are how can you focus your business on doing one thing? How can you focus your business on your uniqueness and exploit that? That's the takeaways here from Stephanie Breedlove and this specific case study example. Yeah, she, she's a fellow Texan, by the way. She, she's really fantastic to talk with and hear, hear her tell her story. And she went from big consulting to doing what Jamie just talked us through. Pretty amazing. So Jamie, ready for me to take, take this one? Yeah, let's jump into the second case study. Right. So we're talking to Sonny Vanderbeck, right? And so here's, here's his story. So during the days that followed the terrorist attack of September 20, you know, 2011, 20, 2001, most Americans believe that they were at war. The, the crisis paralyzed owners who wondered what would become of the world. S spending stopped. The stock market tanked. At that time, that kind of sounds familiar, right? At that time, Sonny Vanderbeck owned and operated a web hosting company called Data Return and had just seen a $1 billion acquisition offer from Compaq go up in smoke. He literally had the offer in writing. Uh, Vanderbeck, uh, Vanderbeck pivoted and he took, stock, he took stock about what's going on. And his company, Data Return, was burning cash, right? And Vanderbeck figured that they had six months, six months to get a deal done before they could face mortal danger and potentially be out of business. He continued to look for a buyer and soon received another offer from a technology consulting and software business who was rolling up IT service companies. Uh, Vanderbeck agreed to sell Data Return in return for stock. So no cash, he took stock for the deal uh, in the IT service roll up, you know, the, the rolled up company. So soon after the transaction closed, Vanderbeck realized that he had made a mistake. As he looked into the financials of the choir, he, he recounts in his, in his book, selling without, selling without Selling Out, Vanderbeck recognized that his company's acquirer was suffering the consequence of, of a buying spree. They had acquired 40 other companies recently. Um, and they, they were they were running out of cash. Literally, the, the acquirer had bitten off more than they could chew, and had little over a, a year later they, they declared bankruptcy. So here Vanderbeck is with stock in a company that filed bankruptcy, right? So so Vanderbeck had fallen from being just days away from a one billion dollar payday to owning shares in a company that was bankrupt, right? He still had his original data return partner investors who believed in him. So Vanderbeck assembled his team and he, he bought the assets of his former company back from the bankrupt company for, for 30 million. Uh, four years later, as he rebuilt the company, he was able to sell that same company, Data Return, to a, a company called Terramark Worldwide for a transaction valued at 85 million. 
So the, the key takeaway here is to financial performance, right? Make sure you, get, you got enough cash, enough fuel in the tank where you got a time horizon beyond that six months, right? So um, key takeaway, financial performance. And in this case, Vanderbilt probably could have done more due diligence on the acquirer to make sure that they had the wherewithal to keep things going after he was acquired. So it's all about having visibility through using those numbers. What I love about this, Kirk, is that, I mean, gosh, even though it was sort of hit tanked, right? He was able through four years to take it back and rebuild it. So even when you think all hope is lost, it's not. And you can rise from the ashes and build the organization better and bigger and do it. So I hope that this inspires everybody here today uh, to know that even when you think all is lost, it's not. Yeah. Good, good point. It's not bad. In the end, he netted $50 million, right? So not, not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, I love it. Very good. Let's go on to the next guy here, Joshua. Great. All right, let's take a look at Joshua Dick. So he is the CEO of Yearnex. So in 2003, the most common term used to describe the state of the economy was, quote, the jobless recovery. The year began with concerns about the war in Iraq. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell below 8,000 in February. Mortgage rates plummeted to a 30-year low, and homeowners rush to refinance. George Bush cut taxes, hoping that consumers would start spending. It was against this backdrop that Josh Dick took over his father's company, Uranex, which was generating less than $1 million in annual sales across seven product lines. Dick retrenched and jetsoned six of the seven product lines to focus his limited resources on the one product that Dick thought had the most potential to scale. And that was cleaning supplies for commercial coffee makers. Yep, that, cleaning that's supplies. Pretty, that's, yeah, that's pretty narrow, right? You're getting- That little... is very narrow, cleaning supplies for commercial coffee makers. So in other words, it was a niche of a niche. Dick poured all of his limited resources in becoming the best in the world at one thing and ultimately grew Uranex to more than 5 million in EBITDA, which is when he decided to sell it for double digit multiple growth. So the takeaway here is to strategically prune your product offerings. What products or service offerings could you consider dropping to focus more of your efforts on what's working really well in your business? It's hard sometimes to be all things to your clients, but if you can just really leverage and focus on pruning your company and focusing all of your efforts on what you're doing well, you can take your business to the next level. It's also important to note that when Dick sold, he was became an author of a book, Grow Like a Lobster, which I think is a fun title. And he uses the analogy of a lobster's life cycle as the way to describe the business evolution. Mm -hmm. Its hard shell protects the lobster, but once it grows to a specific size, it must shed its shell and develop a new, larger, and protective layer. And during this quote unquote molting process, it lays itself vulnerable on the ocean floor while a new hard protective layer forms. So how does that translate to business? Well, many owners feel unprotected right now, which is why just like a lobster is the time to retool and build a more durable business. Mm -hmm. So that resonates, I think, with everyone. Yeah. You, you know, Jay, I, I can imagine. So the family owned business, Josh is stepping up and can you imagine the discussion that he had that moment where he's going to pitch, let's get, a, get rid of everything. Yeah. Sorry, dad, we're going to drop these six product lines. I'm going to only focus on one and it's yeah. coffee cleaning. Yeah. I have an idea. I have clarity. <laughs> but it worked and it's a perfect example, a perfect case study. I love it. Yeah. Very good. Let's, let's go on to John Moore here. Okay. John Moore, during the great recession that began in 2008, it was a time of massive disruption. I, I mean, I think most of us in the room can remember this. Uh, I remember October, it was scary. Uh, so stock markets around the world were dropping hundreds of points a day. Banks were failing. Many, including John Moore, thought the world might be ending, 
right? Moore is the founder of 3dformedical.com. This is a medical a, a company that creates 3D dimensional models of human body, photograph them, and then license them for te uh, textbook, textbook publishers. Um, when the Great Recession of 2008-2009 hit Ireland, more business took a significant turn for the worse, and he realized that he needs to reinvent the company. Moore decided to offer an application that students could use to learn about anatomy. Instead of focusing exclusively on textbook publishers, they started selling their app directly to students, teachers, and medical professionals. The business began to hum as a more as more universities, including the likes of Stanford and Cambridge, signed on. By 2019, 3D4 Medical was up to 75 employees, including a reliable management team. Moore was making plans to continue to grow the business when one of the biggest textbook publishers in the world made an offer to buy them for $50.6 million. And think about the pivot, right? This, this is growth potential, look at the marketplace. They were a B2B company who licensed their product to textbook publishers, you know, pretty much a one-time kind of fee, right, based on how many textbooks are being published, maybe some royalties. Uh, he pivoted from that to being a, a B to C, selling directly to consumers, the students, the teachers, the medical providers, uh, built in a subscription basis. So every month, based on the number of subscribers, you're getting some amount of money. And then to do this, he really had to know what their intellectual property was, which was that the anatomy, the content, right? And developed a different mechanism to deliver it directly to the consumer. I mean, what, what a pivot, right? And I bet you between then and now, there were some sleepless nights. I can only imagine. Again, another fascinating case study example on growth potential. And, I, you know, as you listen to all of these case studies and these stories, I mean, you see people who are reinventing themselves, rising up during times of crisis, and it's inspirational to us all. Yeah, very good. I mean, it keeps me going. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, let's jump into the next one. This is Griffin Thau. He is the founder of Puravada Bracelets. And back in 2010, I love this sort of entrepreneurial story. He was finishing his final year at San Diego State University and trying to figure out what to do with his life. He had spent the last of his savings on a graduation trip to Costa Rica, where he crossed paths with two bracelet artisans named George and Joaquin who were living in poverty. George and Joaquim made beautiful, colorful, handmade bracelets that seemed to capture the essence of their journey. So Thal took the last few hundred dollars in his bank account and asked the artisans to make 400 bracelets. Upon returning to San Diego, Thal got to work selling the bracelets. They built a simple website, took orders online, and with no money to advertise, Thal promoted his lifestyle brand on social media. Over the next nine years, Thal built Puravada into a $68 million company with supply continuing to come from George and Joaquin, who now employ, by the way, 1,000 people. And in July of 2019, Vera Bradley announced their acquisition of a 75% stake in Puravada bracelets for $75 million in cash, plus a $22.5 million earnout, which equates to a little more than nine times that year's adjusted EBITDA. One thing that's important to note here is that Puravada created a novel subscription program which offered loyal customers a new selection of bracelets and other goodies each month. And at the time of the Vera Bradley acquisition, they were doing roughly 15% of their revenue in recurring revenue, meaning mm -hmm. through the subscription services. So I think the great takeaways here are, do you have a subscription for recurring revenue model in your business? And if you do, uh, how can you improve it or increase your recurring revenue model? And if you don't, how can you adopt one? How can you build a recurring revenue model? 
If he can do it with bracelets, you can do it too. Yeah, Jamie, that, that one's just crazy. From traveling in Costa Rica to seeing people on the streets making bracelets to a business that he could sell for $50 million. I mean, it's crazy. I agree. You know? I mean, I agree with you. I think um, if he can do that, we, we can do whatever our goals are respectively for our companies and our, t our team members who are doing this with us. Well, let's jump into the next one. I'm excited about this story, uh, the restart. This is the guy, the restart. So in, in 2012, Business Life was restarting after the Great Recession. The Federal Reserve was using quantitative easing to try to kickstart the economy, which was still suffering. The un unemployment rate was around 9%. I bet you we, we wish we had that now, huh? It yeah. was, yeah, it, it was against this backdrop that Sulman co-founded an IT service company called Flux7. Sulman and his partner started out as two smart guys with a laptop and would take on any project, right? And get, you do what you gotta do. The, the partners quickly realized that they needed to focus and become the best in the world at one thing. They decided on becoming experts in helping companies migrate their technology to the Amazon Web Service, AWS. This focus created a domino effect where the more they concentrated their marketing, the more they attracted customers interested in AWS, uh, they were able to say no quickly to the wrong fit customers, the ones they really couldn't do great work for. So, they, they, they started reserving their sales resources for people who wanted to leverage AWS. And they also found that, found the focus accelerated their referrals, which in turn fueled their growth. So by 2019, Flux7 had 70 employees and was acquired by NTT Data for an undisclosed amount. But it, it's assumed and considered to be significant. So, so here's something where they, they went from being jack of all trades to having that niche so they could really master that part of the market mar, marketplace. And um, they, they, they really relied on so that they could scale. It's not two smart guys. You know, it's the owner's trap if knowing how to sell and deliver is resides in the owner's head. So they were able to scale. They created repeatable processes that were valuable where they, they could bring on those 70 team members who could crush it and do, deliver great services for their clients. So the key learning thing here is, you know, use process to cultivate that expert result so that you can scale across multiple team members doing, doing great things with your clients. So that's the lesson here, document your process. Yeah, and it, it begs the question to ask yourself, how strong is the documentation around your business processes? Can it be improved upon? So that's a, you know, like you just said, Kirk, that's a great takeaway and making sure that we have strong documentation. And as the company continues to grow, the processes change. So it's an ever ongoing, ever adapting tool or piece that we need to focus on. Yeah, and, so, and sometimes for owners, it's, it's tough to let go because owners are really good at what they do. But with complete certainty, if, if things are limited to the owner, they're in that owner's trap, for sure the owner is leaving money on the table because no matter how broad the owner's wingspan is, it's still finite. And, and likewise, when it's time to step back from the business and pass the torch, you know, there's seven different succession options. If you are your business, it, you can't very well transfer it. So then you get locked into, you know, multiple year earnouts and things do not generally go the way most CEOs expect them to go. So, so you know, you know, from the beginning, cultivating the expertise through process and deliver, you know, the expertise and delivery through process will it'll pay off for you now and tomorrow. So we go to the last, Oh, last last few here, right? Yeah, so um, seven. number seven. Number seven here, this is on Scott Moore. So 2012 was another, was also the year that Scott Moore lost his job in a restructuring. In a restructuring. Moore decided to turn his crisis into an opportunity by starting a restaurant with his friend, Gus Evans, in Jacksonville, Florida. So all my Jacksonville, Florida folks, you may have heard of this company. They called it the Maple Street Biscuit Company and offered what they referred to as comfort food with a modern twist. Moore invested a chunk of his life savings in the first restaurant and it was a success. 
A second store worked as well too, and then a third. Emboldened by their early results, Moore wrote a business plan for a massive expansion, which called for building 25 locations across southern eastern United States in just 18 months. To fund the growth, he put his house up for collateral and a mm. bank loan and personally signed a guarantee on that. If he had failed, it would have left him penniless. And as it turned out, the gamble paid off when the restaurant chain was acquired by Cracker Barrel. That was back in November of 2019, so just last year. And it was a $36 million all cash transaction. Maple Street had created a durable competitive advantage because of its brand, which was defined by Moore's careful choice of words. One way to build the value of your brand and your business is to own the vocabulary that you use to describe it. And Maple Street did this in three very specific ways. First, they owned their product names. Maple Street started with creative names for biscuits that they served. So instead of a generic fried chicken biscuit that you could get from any fast food chain, they offered the quote, squawking goat. <laughs> Fun one. Instead of a generic sounding vegetarian biscuit, they offered the iron goat. Think of spinach and goat cheese on a biscuit. Mm -hmm. They also, uh, they owned their employee titles. So the people in charge of bringing the Maple Street brand to life are their employees. But Moore was very careful not to call them that. He refers to employees as family members and customers as guests. It's a nod to the vision that Moore had for making his stores a community hub. And he refers to store managers as community leaders. Maple Street also owned the words that they use to describe the way that they do things. So at Maple Street, Moore talks about gracious service, which is about treating customers with grace. The restaurant business has a back office who in which the people there order the food, they pay the invoices, but instead of referring to headquarters in a generic way, he called it the family support team. It's the kind of attention to detail, Kirk, that delivered the extreme customer satisfaction from engaged family members who built an incredible brand. And it's this brand that allowed him to sell for 36 million in cash. So the takeaway here is what steps can you take to enhance your customer experience, engage your team, and strengthen your brand? Yeah. I think these are great examples. Yeah, you literally bring in that wow factor. And you think about the restaurant industry, that is one of the most competitive industries. And, in, you know, from a customer standpoint, customers can be very particular about their food. I mean, so... We, well done, Scott. You, you did it. <laughs> yes, he did. You got All right, it. well, let's jump into our last case study, which is case study number eight. Yep, yeah, I'll, I'll bring it home here. So in June of 2017, Canadian Danielle Simpson found herself in the living room with her, her partner in Berlin, Germany, right? So stuck at home and with little in the way of a social network in Germany, Simpson decided to teach English as a second language. Right, seems reasonable. And then Simpson's partner, Arvid, noticed her struggling to complete feedback reports, you know, about the students, for the students. Uh, most of Simpson's report cards were similar, right? There's it, kind of an 80-20 there, that she had to waste hours of time retyping identical messages about dozens of students every night, right? So, so Cal, a software engineer, saw a process right for automation and build a tool that allowed a teacher to select from a pre, you know, preset of scripted feedback for students. And, uh, and this dramatically accelerated the process of providing comments about each student's daily, right? So, so Cal and Simpson reasoned that the tool might help other English teachers and, and offered it on a subscription basis through Facebook, uh, through a Facebook group set up for you know, expat teachers. Two years later, the company had created a recurring revenue flow and, um, and, and they decided to accept SureSwift's capital offer to 
sell their company for, again, another undisclosed amount, but they described it as a life-changing transaction for the couple. So, so here, here's an example where, you know, we're going to illustrate positive cash flow, right? And, and with a subscription as a service business, it's prepaid. Even, you know, before that month of service, you know, clients' credit cards are automatically hit. So you're moving from a negative cash flow where normally the way we work is we, we do the work, we make payroll, we pay rent. Then after the, the month is over, we invoice the customer and give them like net 30 to pay us. So now we're in like the met, you know, the third month before we get paid. Well, the, these types of businesses flip that on, on its head where you get, you know, for the type of service they do, you get, you get prepaid. And um, in other types of services, if you look at that, that cycle, you know, can, can you think of ways to shorten it, shorten it for you to get cash sooner, if not even before you have to lay out expenses? And that, that's moving from, you know, to become, you know, cash positive. Uh, an example might be build more frequency, you know, frequently to build every week instead of waiting until month in as one example. Um, but definitely an area that we like to work on to help companies have more working capital. So what, what do you think, Jamie? Well, as you know, like they say, cash is king. So <laughs> having positive cash flow is quite important. I just, I love this example. Um, you know, automation is a, is a great way to improve and enhance. And, you know, it's just amazing that people can be entre entrepreneurs and develop products and services out of challenges that they see and problems that they solve and fix. And this is another great example of that. So these are the eight specific case studies that we thought um, would resonate the most here. Um, I'd love to talk about how these essentially roll up here into the drivers uh, that Foresight CFO and the 2% CEO Mastermind go through. These are the most important drivers when you look at growing your business and building business valuation. So Kirk, will you take us through this and tell us a little bit more about these specific drivers? We heard a lot of them covered in the eight case studies as we reviewed them. Yeah, we, we, we literally went through each one, you know, the uniqueness, customer satisfaction, that financial performance, it, you know, literally based on not only us working with hundreds of CEOs globally, but, but also, you know, based on a database of 34,000 private companies, which is hard data to get to. Uh, it, it's proven that these are the drivers. If you if you, if you get clarity about what to do in your business, when you run them through the lens of these drivers, you can come down to one, two, or three options that really make a lot of sense for that next step. Uh, in, in particular, now the growth potential, where uh, you know pivoting, you know, do I do more with existing customers or new customers, existing products or new new products and services, you know, based on you know the the change that's going on in our economy. So this this is where you get, you know proactive and you get clarity about where to advance. Uh, we, we do have a score, you know, 39 questions. You, you can actually get a statistically valid score on where you come out overall and, and where you come out for each driver to inform your decision making. Uh, we, we know for a fact that businesses who score 80 plus, on average, they're 71% more valuable at that time than they would be otherwise. You know, if an, an example again is if, you're, if the business is dependent on the owner, uh, the owner is the business and the business is significantly less valuable. Okay. Did I, did I, did I answer your question, Jamie? Is that? <laughs> you did. So just to recap for those of you listening in, when we send you this complimentary ebook, if you're interested in taking the 2% CEO score to see how you score in these eight, eight drivers, it's a free assessment. So we can provide you with the link and you can do that. So, um, I would love to hear from you guys in the audience on which one of these uh, eight stories, eight case studies may have resonated with you the most. Was it Stephanie Breedlove's story um, and her uniqueness or was it Joshua Dick's story about strategically pruning your company? What are, what are your takeaways from today? Um, so drop them in the comments and let us know if there was something that resonated the most with you that you can implement into your business today uh, that can help you continue to grow during this unique time that we're facing. Yeah, that's great. And here's a perspective. I mean, in this, in this webinar, we started out with Napoleon Hill, 1929, all the way through case studies, nine, you know, uh, 2019. So what we're talking about, this is timeless, right? This, this does work. 
right? So if, you're, if there's something you're questioning, um, you know, that, that insight may, may, may benefit you. And, and, and I, I want to add, in addition to getting the book, um, I, I'm actually a member of Jamie's mastermind. Um, it's a life changer for me because I, I got to have somebody I can talk to, at, you know, with Jamie in the peer group. They are that group I can, I can talk to about anything. So, um, Jamie, you want to you want to do a shout out about what what you do with CEOs? Sure. Well, I subscribe to the fact that every CEO needs a tribe of others that they can learn from, work with, vet ideas and experience sharing through, and that's what I do. And I do it through virtual and in person options. Um, if you're if you're a part of a CEO mastermind or CEO group, that's great. And keep on keeping on with that. If you're not and you're interested in learning about how you can connect with other CEOs and work on ways to grow your business, please reach out to me. My email address is here. It's jamie at 2percentceo.com. My phone number is also listed here. And I'd love to work with you and help you grow your business alongside of these other great CEOs. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, and likewise, we, we come at it from a different perspective than what Jamie will as a CEO coach. We come at it being accountable with the numbers on your team. You know, how do we get visibility to see down the road, evaluate different options, and then literally implement, and then week to week, you know, let's see if we're on track or off track so that we can respond proactively. Um, so that, that's what we do as growth CFOs. We do that globally. So if you're interested in learning more about how, you know, having the numbers can help you, you know, basically have more cash in the bank, in a, in a much more valuable business, uh, shoot me an email um, and we'll, we'll hop on a call together. Um, we're gonna, following this, this webinar, we're gonna send you a link where you can download the ebook and uh, you can also have access to this recording to go over some of the finer points that might be of interest to you. But thank you so much for you know, taking time out to you know, learn more together. Um, you know, and you know, uh, Jamie and I are here to help you out as, as as you see fit. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining and for jumping in today. It's great to have you guys on this webinar and we hope that this inspired you. Uh, these incredible stories inspired you to just know that, gosh, you know, these people were able to find ways to reinvent themselves, uh, solve challenges, problems, rise from the ashes during times of crisis. And you can too, if that's what your business is facing. There's always opportunities to evolve and to grow. And these incredible eight case studies are some good examples of those that found uh, a way to, to do just that. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and look out for our ebook and uh, the opportunity to take the 2% CEO score. Yep. Be well. Thank you again, Jamie. <laughs> Thanks, Kirk. This is fun.